Chapter 11 Nada I wakened to the sound of Carl closing the door as he left for his class. It was early, only 7.45. I lay back in bed and wished that Carol was beside me. I wished that I had the power to pull her through time 174 years to the now of my apartment. I had to smile at the thought of what a sensation Carol would make if I took her to the student union, her magnificent six-foot-three-inch body, her face of incredible classic beauty, and her tremendous joy and vitality would stir things up. Talk about riots! I could see Microman fighting savagely just to get close to her. And how would I feel? Well, I thought, from my limited perspective, I wouldn't want to share her with anyone, so I wouldn't even let her step out of the apartment. I finally decided it was a good thing I couldn't transport Carol to 1976, because 1976 wasn't ready for her, and while I was in 1976, I probably wouldn't be ready for her either. This last thought made me wonder what would happen when Carol and I went to Micro Island. Of course, the inhabitants would be used to seeing members of the Macro Society, but they often tried to kill these visitors. How would I react if someone tried to kill Carol? I didn't have to think very long about my answer. I'd fight, I'd even kill, if I had to in order to protect her. Oh, that's great, I thought. Now I'm going to Micro Island to perform like a medieval knight errant, fighting for the life and honor of his fair lady. I shook my head in amused frustration. Where Carol was concerned, I was developing some very micro feelings. I decided that I'd better practice my macro powers with micro people today and see if I could do better than I had at the supermarket. Maybe I could learn how to comfortably deal with micro people before I went to Micro Island. After all, 1976 offered me an ample supply to practice on. By the time I was through eating, I had decided that when I finished writing in my journal, I would go looking for threatening situations and see if I could learn to handle them. Three hours later, I was sitting at a table in a seemingly always crowded student union cafeteria, drinking hot chocolate and trying telepathically to tune in to people about me. At first, I picked up the usual micro-concerns, such as fear about semester exams, excitement over this evening's basketball game, or date, or money matters, or frustrations at not being more successful with others. This last frustration was often sexual, particularly from the table full of men near me who were wistfully eyeing the girls as they passed by. It was their scornful sneers at one of the girls who passed that caused me to look up and see the object of their contempt. She was a tall, thin girl, so gaunt that she appeared almost emaciated. Her hair was long and straight, without any luster, and hung in untidy disarray about her shoulders. Her face, with its bony nose, was one of the most unappealing I had ever seen. Her clothes were too loose, too long, and too nondescript. They seemed to just hang on her like burlap bags. I reached out and made contact with her mind and quickly withdrew. Never had I experienced such sadness, such misery, such bitter hopelessness. I shook my head to clear it of the repugnance and then looked at her again. She was sadly looking about for an empty table where she could be somewhat away from others it was close to noon, and almost all the tables were filled except my small one, which had space for another person across from me. I decided to have her sit at my table. I reached out with my mind and willed her to look at me. She did, and I smiled at her, gesturing the empty seat across from me. She looked behind her and to her side to see if I was addressing someone else, then looked at me with a bewildered and pathetically uncertain gaze. I sent a flow of warm, confident, accepting thoughts. The change in her expression was slow in coming, but when it came I saw the beginnings of an incredulous look of hope. I got up as she approached my table and helped her with the tray upon which she precariously balanced a bowl of soup and a glass of milk. She thanked me in a low whisper and seated herself quietly and proceeded to occupy herself with her soup, using it almost as a barrier to hide behind. I continued to bombard her with the most loving and accepting thoughts that I could generate. After about five minutes of my intense struggle to overcome her mental despair and chronic suspiciousness, I began to achieve some success. She was feeling much more comfortable with me and beginning to steal occasional glances at my face. It was then that I decided to try talking with her. I'm John Lake, I said. I'm working on my doctorate in psychology. She looked up at me with a startled expression. and I could feel her uncertainty as to how to respond. I smiled my most engaging smile and said, I guess you're not sure how to take my talking to you when we never met before. I couldn't help feeling that you were lonely, and I can remember feeling that way myself. She bobbed her head at me and then stared intently at her empty soup bowl. I reached deep within her mind and discovered a great longing to respond to me, but an equally great fear of being rejected or looking foolish, those two universal fears of micro-man. 
I continued to be positive, confident, and accepting thoughts to her. I wondered what her name was and willed her to tell me. There was a short struggle, and then she spoke. My name is Nada Crixley, she whispered, in such a low voice that if I hadn't already picked up her name telepathically, I'd have had to ask her to repeat it. Nada, I said. I like that name, and I like you, too. After I said this, I realized that for some reason I did like this girl. I had gotten beneath her unattractive surface and made contact with a part of her soul which was very satisfying to me. Without thinking, I reached out and captured one of her tiny, thin, bony hands. Again, I saw the startled expression on her face, but I willed her to accept my gesture as one of kindness and genuine concern. I could feel the tension in her arm and body slowly subside. I decided it was time to take the next step. Tell me about yourself, Nada, I asked. I want to know all about you. I felt her wondering why I should want to know about her. Because I like you, I responded to this unspoken thought. And I think I can help solve some problems that are bothering you. How do you know I have problems that you can help me with, she whispered. Well, I replied, everyone has some problems. One of my goals in life is to help as many people as possible solve their problems. She thought about this for a moment, then said, I want to thank you for being so kind to me. I've never met anyone like you before. I don't know how or why, but I'm convinced that somehow you do like me and you do want to help me. I am very grateful. Then you'll let me have the pleasure of getting you a dessert, I said. How about chocolate sundae or maybe strawberry? She smiled shyly and didn't respond, but I caught her thought of how good a strawberry sundae would taste. Okay, I said, I'll surprise you. All you have to do is save my seat for me. As I left our table, I sent as powerful a thought as I could to the girl at the ice cream counter, and by the time I got to her, she was already busily preparing two sundaes, one chocolate and one strawberry. I waited till she had finished, thanked her for reading my mind, and paid for them. All the way back to our table, I could see her startled expression and feel her wonderment at the kooky possibility that she really had somehow read my mind. The strawberry sundae proved to be the final step in overcoming Nada's shyness with me. She began talking about herself. She was a 20-year-old liberal arts junior who lived off campus with her mother and stepfather. While she didn't say so, I picked up from her mind that she desperately wanted to escape from her tyrannical mother, who hated her for being ugly, and a coarse, sneering stepfather who enjoyed tormenting her about her looks. She didn't know what she wanted to do after college, and while her grades were excellent, going to classes was a torture because of her shyness. She was majoring in English composition and literature, and her one escape was in reading and writing. As I listened intently to her talking about her happiness in writing short stories, I noticed that the more she talked about this area of her life, the more animated her face became. The dark eyes came alive, and the voice rose from a whisper to an easily understandable level. I learned from her mind that I was the second person in her life she had ever talked to about her writing. first person had been her high school English teacher, an elderly lady who died shortly after Nita's graduation. Since this old woman had been the only friend in her life, her loss had been almost too much for Nada to endure. I realized that Nada had completely accepted her mother's point of view of herself as being ugly blight on her parents' lives. Consequently, she was filled with self-loathing and massive feelings of worthlessness and inadequacy. It was no wonder she tried desperately to avoid contact with others, since she believed her appearance was completely revolting to all who saw her. Now how could I help Nada? Every night I had access to all the knowledge of the Macro Society's central information. How could I, with my macro powers, change Nada's life? What did I want to do? Well, I thought, I want to help her find a new life in which she can learn to like herself and the world about her. But wouldn't I need all the power and wisdom of Raina to accomplish such a miracle? As I carefully but surreptitiously examined the face and figure of Nada, I wondered if even a ten-level awareness would be sufficient to change Nada's self-concept. But I decided I was going to try. After questioning Nada about her typing ability and learning that she was a very good typist, I offered her a job typing up notes from the dissertation research that Carl and I had been doing, which he was still working on. When I finally convinced her that I really needed her help and that she would be doing me a great favor by accepting the job, I took the big plunge. Nada, I said, I want you to move out of your mother's home and into an apartment at the building where I live. Yes, I said, forestalling her objection. I know you don't have much money, but since Carl and I own the building we live in, your rent can be part of your monthly salary. 
Carl and I will be conveniently located near you so that you'll actually be able to function not only as a typist, but sort of as a research assistant. I had been talking fast and off the top of my head, but now I paused to check Nita's reaction. She was so overwhelmed by me that resistance seemed impossible. I felt that somewhere in the past hour she had recaptured totally the loving, accepting thoughts that I had been sending her. But then, how could a person languishing in hell turn down such an invitation to heaven? I told her that I would help her move into her new quarters immediately. Fifteen minutes later, we arrived at her home in a taxi. The house was a run-down, two-story stucco located in a fast-decaying neighborhood. I told her taxi driver to wait for us and then accompany Nada to her door. There she hesitated until I calmly but firmly opened the door for her and ushered her inside. I immediately realized why she had hesitated, since charging toward us out of the kitchen was the most formidable-looking harridan I had ever seen. This was Nada's mother, who was roaring at Nada about being late and eyeing me suspiciously. After Nada tried to respond to her mother and got shouted down, I decided to lend a hand. I told Nada to go to her room and pack her belongings, then with a gentle nudge sent her on her way. I stopped her mother in mid-roar with a mighty piquet shove that sent her reeling backward to land with a thud on the couch. Be quiet, Mrs. Crixley, I said. I want you to hear what I've got to say. Her mouth was open, but no sound came out, and her eyes were enormous as she finally managed to gasp. She pushed me. Really, Mrs. Crixley, I replied. You know that I didn't touch you. Now pay attention to me. I offered your daughter a job as typist and research assistant to myself and my partner. We're doing psychological research at the university. I've asked her to take an apartment near the university so she'll be closer to her work. I'll advance her enough on her salary so that she can pay the rent and live quite comfortably. Now do you have any questions? Mrs. Crixley was obviously not used to being dominated and treated in such a confidently imperious manner. She opened and closed her mouth for all the world like an ugly flounder that has just found itself beached. I decided to keep the pressure on before she could jump back into the water. Of course, I continued, this will relieve you of the considerable financial burden of caring for your daughter and providing her with an education. Naturally, her salary would be sufficient to comfortably cover the tuition for her for the remaining years of college. I had decided to go all the way. Since Carl and I had invested our inheritance in the apartment building we lived in, we had more than sufficient funds for our rather modest needs and could afford my project with Nita without too much difficulty. Mrs. Crixley was shaking her head in a bewildered manner. Things are happening just too fast for her to comprehend. Was she really going to be able to unload that ugly blight of a daughter, she was thinking. I easily picked up her thoughts. However, it was painful for me to tune into the old woman's mind. There was no physical ugliness that could match the mental ugliness of her mind. It was a seething cauldron of spite, greed, jealousy, crawling hatreds. I withdrew my mind contact with a violent shudder of revulsion. At that moment, Nada entered the room with all her worldly possessions in a small battered suitcase. When her mother protested the ownership of the suitcase, I swiftly handed her a $20 bill, saying I was sure that this would amply repay her. She was still looking greedily at the bill in her hand when I took the suitcase from Nada and hurried out of the house to the waiting taxi. Shortly over an hour later, having stopped off at a supermarket, a different one, and purchased some $40 worth of food, I was busily stocking the refrigerator of Nada's new apartment. It was a large three-room apartment with bedroom, living room, kitchen. It was nicely furnished. Nada walked about in a happy daze and kept saying, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Lake. Please call me John, I kept saying as I put away our groceries. And remember, I live just one floor above you in apartment 303 in case you need anything. I'll have the phone connected tomorrow so you can call me any time. Nada came partially out of her days and asked, But when do I start work and where? Tomorrow, I said. You can start to work right here in your apartment. I'll come back this evening with my typewriter, which I'll leave with you. It's a little electric portable, easy to use. Then I persuaded her to sit down with me in her comfortable new living room. For the next half hour, I encouraged her to talk about her writing and reassured her that she could continue taking all the courses she wanted at the university, though I felt she looked upon her new job as an opportunity to drop her courses. All the while I was there, I kept making a steady flow of the most positive and confident telepathic messages. By the time I left her, she was almost glowing with happiness, and her face didn't look anywhere near as ugly as it had when I'd first seen it. By the time I got back to my apartment, I was all ready for a rest. All this practice of my new powers had taken its toll, and it felt good to sit down. 
After resting a few minutes, I brought this journal up to date. When Carl came in, I handed him my journal and headed for the kitchen to cook up a couple of steaks. I caught myself wishing for the mealtime conveniences of 2150. Since I had left Nada, I had tuned into her every 15 or 20 minutes to give her another mental shot of loving acceptance and confidence. It seemed to be working very well. Over dinner, Carl and I discussed my project with Nada, and I solicited his help. He was perfectly agreeable to my wanting us to help her, and said that he would be glad not to have to depend on the university typing pool any longer. I didn't reveal my long-range plans for Nada, which involved shaping an entirely new self-concept for her. I decided I would let Carl meet her, then we could talk further about my plans. About eight that evening, Carl and I went, typewriter in hand, down to Nada's apartment. She welcomed us with a little shyness, but talked rather easily with Carl about the typing requirements of our research. I let him do almost all the talking. When we left, almost an hour later, I was congratulating myself on my progress with Nada. However, Carl brought me back to reality. Really, John, he said when we were back at our apartment. You weren't kidding when you said she was homely. You weren't very impressed, I commented. Carl laughed and said, I was impressed all right. Come on, John. She's probably a very nice person, but did you look at her? My God, she's a walking disaster area. Hmm, I responded. You really think it's that bad, huh? Carl shook his head. You know, it seems to me that if you're going to buy her groceries and provide her with an apartment, you could have at least provided her with some decent clothes, too. Yeah, I know, Carl. I agreed. They're pretty bad. I wanted to fix her up with something better, but I don't know anything about women's clothes. I thought one of your girlfriends could maybe help pick out some nice things for you to give her. You want me to do this? Carl asked with a startled expression. Of course, I explained. The more positive male attention we give her, the sooner we'll be able to change her self-concept from one of self-loathing to self-confidence. But, but John, Carl sputtered, you can't give her a new face and figure, so it certainly isn't fair to kid her all along. I'm not kidding her, I answered. She's a valuable and worthwhile person no matter how she looks, and I'm going to let her know that. At least you and I think so. Yeah, but what about other people, Carl objected. How are you going to help her adjust to the fact that everyone else will continue to view her as a homely self? That's got to keep her self-concept a shambles for as long as she lives. I think she can become physically attractive, I said. After all, she wouldn't look so scrawny with another 20 pounds on her. Hmm. Fifty be more like it, Carl replied. Why, she must be five foot eight inches tall, but she looks like she might weigh ninety pounds if we got her good and wet. Even if she put on enough weight to curve her out, how are you going to hide that nose of hers? Hmm, I pondered. You're right about her nose. Well, I'm sure a little plastic surgery would fix that up. Can we afford that? We can, can't we? Carl gave me a startled look and said, Boy, you've really gone overboard. Sure, I guess we can afford it, John. But do you know what you're talking about? Do you have any idea how much this little project of yours is going to cost? Well, let me tell you. It's going to cost a pile. I couldn't find a better use for it, Carl, I said. Besides, if I'm successful, I won't need any money three months from now. Huh. But if you're not successful, Carl grunted, you'll sure have cleaned out your account. I laughed at Carl's gloomy expression. Cheer up, I said. If Microman can earn a million selfishly, I'm sure that with the aid of the macro powers, I can earn a million unselfishly. What other projects do you have in mind? Carl asked a bit sarcastically. I don't know for sure, I said. Maybe I'd better see how this one comes out before I start another one. That's a damned sound idea, Carl said with relief. We talked for a while about 2150. Then I said that I was eager to get back to CI and ask some more questions, especially about how I could work this miracle I had embarked upon. And I retired early.